Hello, and welcome to our very first The 19th Celebrates event. It's a new series that we're launching to honor and celebrate the communities that we serve at The 19th. We'll do this throughout the year with thoughtful interviews with leading thinkers, creators, and cultural figures. And I am so excited tonight to be kicking off Black History Month and our celebration of Black History Month with trailblazing American Fawn Weaver. Fawn is the CEO of the investment firm Grant Sydney Inc. and owner of Uncle Nearest Whiskey and a New York Times bestselling author. Fawn, welcome, welcome to the 19th. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited for our audience to be in conversation with you. So let's just get right into it. All right. So I, I think we really can't start this conversation without talking about the inspiration for you being where you are today. Tell our audience who Nathan Nearest Green was and how you came to his story. Absolutely. Well, Nearest Green, and I'll, I'll circle back to why we don't refer to him by his legal name. Uh, the first reason is, is he didn't. But Nearest, Nearest Green is the world's first known African-American master distiller. He is, uh, what he taught was the sole distinguishment between Kentucky bourbon and Tennessee whiskey. Both are straight bourbon whiskey. However, you cannot make Tennessee whiskey without actually making it, bottling it, aging it in Tennessee. But the distinguishment there, other than state location, is what Nears Green taught. It's a filtration process. And, and so that is what we know. But the reason why we even know it is because he taught it to the most famous whiskey maker of all time, Jack Daniel. So he was not just Jack's teacher, he was also his mentor, he was also his friend, and he was also his first master distiller. By all accounts, it is the first case of allyship that I am familiar with in our country in terms of business. And out of all places, it happened in a town called Lynchburg, Tennessee, just above the Alabama border. So if that's not God, I don't know what is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he was doing it in 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 our Reverend Reverend Call's uh, backyard. Well, absolutely, and it's I mean we own that property now, and so to say backyard, it, it would seem like you could see it, but it's that property is three hundred and thirteen acres, and at that time it was three hundred and thirty eight, and and Dan Call basically had his house on one part of the property, his church at the four at the end of the other part of the property, and then the distillery was at the other part of the property. So his church and his distillery, he kept pretty far away from one another because the temperance movement was about to run through here. And let's just say uh, they gave him a, a run for his money. I do want to address why we do not call him Nearest Green. And uh, the reason why we call him Uncle Nearest, even though most people try to shy away from aunt or uncle because what the historic nature of those terms have been. But in Lynchburg, Tennessee, the most respected people in town when Nearest was alive was Uncle Jack. That's Jack Daniel. The only bottle to have ever had his face on it was a bottle that came out during his time alive. And it was called Uncle Jack. Uh, and Uncle Felix, also white, and Uncle Nearest. In Lynchburg, it truly was a term of endearment and had absolutely nothing to do with race and everything to do with respect. Mm -hmm. And so we refer to him as Uncle Nearest because that's how everyone referred to him. But Nearest Green, the reason why we use that is that is the name that his children chose to use, even on legal documents, his grandchildren, and he did as well. And my guess is that it's because the largest slave trader in Middle Tennessee, who came through here uh, collecting Confederate soldiers, if you will, to join his escort is Nathan Bedford Forrest. So my guess is Nearest was given that legal name. And when he had the opportunity to change it, he did. So that's the reason why we don't refer to him as Nathan. Yeah. And so we absolutely honor him as Uncle Nearest. Uh, I mean, what was it when you when you came across this story? What was it about Uncle Nearest's story that was so powerful to you? And, and, and I wonder, you know, you're a serial entrepreneur. What do you see of yourself in Uncle Nearest? Yeah, well, here, here's the interesting thing is, is what actually drew me to the story were, were, was twofold. It was equally Nearest and Jack, and I'll explain why that was. Uh, the story originally came out in 2016, the end of June. We were in the midst of this country being torn apart by the, the Trump uh, race card that was being, the, the Trump card, which I can just still call a race card, uh, <laughs> that was really dividing this country apart. And it was at the height of it because this was leading up to the 2016 election. And this story comes out in the New York Times and the headline was 
Jack Daniel embraces a secret ingredient, help from a slave. Now, if you read the New York Times article, then you would know that at no time did it ever even infer that Jack ever owned slaves, that he stole a recipe, any of that kind of stuff. But for whatever reason, uh, Black Twitter decided to make it that, and then the rest of the world decided that's what it was. And when I had uh, Jamil Hill not too long ago at the distillery, her and Carrie Champion, and uh, Carrie turned to Jamil when I said that, and she was like, it's probably you. And, and Jamil was like, it probably was. <laughs> but it, you know, that, that title became clickbait. It went all around the world and no one actually dove in to say, wait a minute, let's get this straight. So there's a white preacher and distiller that had been given credit for teaching a young Jack Daniel how to make whiskey, but it was likely an enslaved man on his property. Can we pull back some layers on this and figure out what was going on? So I ordered uh, the only known biography for Jack Daniel that had been authorized. It was written in 1967, height of the civil rights era. You have a reporter, a white reporter from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, coming up to Lynchburg, Tennessee to write this authoritative biography of the most famous American whiskey maker of all time. And I expected to see it refer to a Negro or a slave as having taught Jack Daniel. But instead, from very early on until the very end, it referred to Nearest Green, Uncle Nearest, Eli Green, his, his one of Nearest's sons, and George Green, one of his sons. The Greens were mentioned in his in Jack Daniel's biography more times than Jack's own family. That was astounding. And understand 1967, that's you're you're talking about the Detroit riots, right? We know what happened then. The very next year, MLK was shot right down, you know, right on the other side. Here in Tennessee, you've got Pulaski, Tennessee, where the KKK was founded and it was re-emerging at that time. And so the only way a reporter puts a black family in this biography is that whiskey maker's family told him he had to. Like there, there is absolutely no reason. If you think about every other bourbon in the world, most of them coming out of Kentucky, you don't know a single black person's name, but those white men weren't making whiskey. Have you seen how dirty it is to make whiskey? The, the, the white men in the pictures with the collared shirts, I assure you, they were not the ones making the whiskey. Right. So why do we know the name Nearest Green? It is because Jack Daniel's family made sure and Jack made sure we couldn't forget it. So that's where that iconic photo comes from. It's only one of, I think, three photos that Jack ever took in his life. And it's the only one with his leadership team. Everybody in the picture is white, as that would be expected, right? Of a leadership team with your family and all the rest of that stuff. He seated the center position. Well, even now, let's be clear. <laughs> yeah. Let's be real clear. Uh, but, but he seated the center position of his leadership team to a black man. So for me, the question was, how do we not know who this black man is? People were guessing at that time when the article came out, but how do we not know who it is? And then why did no one actually take the time to read the biography to start putting these pieces together? The bi biography is not that big, right? And so for me, what drew me to the story is we're in the middle of 2006, we're being divided by race. And I come across this story that I actually think is a story of allyship. And I wanted to set out to see if I was right, because if I was right, I got to deliver an injection of hope in the midst of a period of time where my particular people were feeling incredibly discouraged as if our country hadn't moved forward. And I was able to point back and say, this is the 19th century that they figured out how to do this in a little town called Lynchburg, Tennessee. So if we can't figure out how to do this in the middle of Chicago in the 21st century, we got a problem. Or 22nd century, we got a problem. Yeah. No, 21st, we're still in 21st. <laughs> still in the 21st. Well, I, I mean, I, I love this story and I, I love hearing you tell this story. I, I mean, because you had no experience in the spirit industry before fate brought this story into, into your life. I mean, the whiskey industry, yeah. as you've alluded to, dominated by white men, 
yeah. like, what people think of as the primary consumers. Uh, and yet bourbon is as American as apple pie for people. And so how is it that you saw yourself really just leading and succeeding in a business where there really was no blueprint for somebody who looks like you? Yeah, you know, I didn't think about that at all. Uh, when people look at my company, they think I'm in the whiskey business. I, I literally post about this every now and again. I'll post about it just to remind people. My company is, we're not in the whiskey business. It's why I look at all the other bourbons and and, and spirits and they, they like to compete with Uncle Nears. I'm like, don't bother. We're not competing with you because we're not in the whiskey business as far as I'm concerned. We are in the legacy cementing business. If Nears Green had been making jeans, blue jeans, this company would be blue jeans. And so it is only because where his legacy sits is smack dab in the middle of Tennessee whiskey and bourbon that we're even in the middle of the bourbon industry. So because I came into this looking to cement a legacy and not looking to shake up an industry, the latter happened because of the former. But the the former was the only reason I stepped into this business. Yeah. And, and I absolutely think that that is how so many of us approach business. Um I mean, the idea of success literally is redefined. I mean, Uncle Nears obviously financially successful. Yes, it has won awards, but but it really just seems like to me, looking at you, success has so many other meanings. Legacy, like you mentioned, duty, community. Can you can you just talk about what your company as a brand stands for and why that matters, particularly for the black community? Our very first company principle, we had 10 that I established very early on in, in the lifespan of this company. And the very first one is we do it with excellence or not at all. And so it's not that we've just won some awards. It's literally that we are the most awarded bourbon of the last four years in a row. We've only been out five and a half. Yep. So the fact that we go toe to toe with the Pappy Van Winkles and all of the ones that people consider the creme de la creme, and we take home the double gold and the best in class every time, that's excellent. Uh, and when we opened up our distillery, our 323 acre distillery, every square inch of that is literally built. I, I like to say it is it is the ground that was built by the impossible because it should not have been possible based on there's never been anyone else's, there's never been anyone else that is not white male that has been able to succeed in this industry, that has been able to build a distillery that people actually travel to uh, from all over the world. And every aspect, aspect of it is done with excellence. It's a masterclass in storytelling. And so for, for me, when I look at uh, Black people, when I look at my people and for women, I am so clear in saying, this isn't successful because we have a great story. This isn't successful because we have a great brand. This is successful because we do all things with excellence or we don't do them at all. A lot of people jump in and go, I'm determined to do something. Well, determination without consistency, without excellence, not going to get you anything, not anything that you really truly want. And so for me, I love being able to be that person that people look at and say, okay, if she could do it, then I most certainly can do it. It's the it's sort of the story of, of the, the, the four minute mile, right? For our entire human history, the thought was it was impossible to hit a four minute mile. And so for all of those years that they are running, doing the Olympics and all the rest of that craziness, uh, no one hit a four minute mile. Then the per first person hits a four minute mile and only held the record for 48 days. Now a four minute mile is nothing, right? And so for, for us, it is when you're looking at our brand, number one, it is the first company ever built by a non-celebrity black woman that is over a billion dollars in valuation. Only one ever. So this is the four minute mark, right? This is the four minute mile. We hit it. Now, how quickly everybody else gets to do it, I'm hoping is really, really, really quick. So that's what I look at the company representing uh, the success. It only matters because success begets success. And yes. people want to follow success. And people are encouraged by success. And success gives them hope. It's the only reason success matters. Otherwise, I, I could care less. Yeah, I, I love what you're you're saying. I mean, because it's so clear that representation matters to you and, and also so does excellence and, and that it's important 
to you being black and being a woman and leading in this space, but also just to be recognized at just the best at what you do, period. Yes. Yes. I always tease that, you know, people like to put black excellence, hashtag black excellence on so many things. And some of that stuff is not that excellent. So I'm like, I need another category for what it is that we're doing because <laughs> this is a level of excellence, not at least seen before in our industry. And I, I'd venture to say not seen in, in a lot of industries. Yeah. I mean, maybe, uh, I don't know, hashtag beyond excellence. I don't know, but yes. Something. Yeah. Excellence is baseline. <laughs> well, I, I do also want to talk because because you are normalizing the leadership of women and people of color. Uh, you've got the first all women led team in the whiskey business. I know that was intentional, but can you talk about why it matters? And 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 if there was a strategy behind how you kind of decided when and how to show that leadership to the industry, to yeah. the country, and and what's been the response? Yeah, well, number one, I didn't I didn't even realize I had an all women team, uh, all women leadership team. I know it sounds odd, but in my company, there's no hierarchy. So we all come around the table and you'll have a sort a sales coordinator at the same table that I'm sitting at with my chief business officer. Our SVPs will sit at the same table as our assistants. Right. And so because of that, I'm always surrounded by women and men. It wasn't until I was doing an interview and someone was asking me about my leadership team and I shared each person's name and what they did. And it was that person in the press that said, I'm sorry, did you just name all women? And I literally had to think about it. And I said, y you know, I, I guess I did. But, but I, it never dawned on me that all the men in my company report into women because I hired based on excellence. That's it. Excellence and a desire to, to build something that will outlive us all. And it just so happened that the people that were the best for the job were, were women. My company looks like America. It's a little bit over 40% BIPOC. It's more than 50% women. Uh, the one place that we over-index greatly is with, with Black Americans because we've got maybe 25% of my company is black and only I think something like two or three percent is is Hispanic and we know that number's flop. <laughs> that number is flipped for sure. And so yeah. I've got some some work to do in, in regard to building that and bolstering that side of it. But for the most part, you see my company and it's in direct reflection of what America looks like. And so what we've been able to do is say, listen, if you actually give all of America a shot, Success is, I mean, it, it's going to naturally come because now you've got everybody around the table and no one feels as though their, their opinions don't matter. Everyone is speaking with the same level of confidence, no matter what position they're in. So it's not just about race. It's not just about gender. It's also about giving everybody an equal voice. And in my company, a, a sales coordinator ha outrules me. I, I, I'll give you this because this is this is coming out pretty soon but i did a photo shoot with my entire uh with all the women of uncle nearest and the person smack dab in the middle towering over all of us is our sales coordinator and i put her in that position in the photo because there is no hierarchy in, in my company so i think there's a lot of levels of leadership training here that we're kind of doing and uh and and people always say well you know women can't get along there's there's cattiness, there's emotional and emotions, all the rest of that stuff. And I literally have lost one leader in five and a half years. One. Wow. Everybody else has been with me from, from the beginning. So I think that we're, we're changing how people see a corporate structure set up that succeeds. And, and this is what I believe that a corporate structure will look like moving forward if the companies want to succeed. Well, it, it, it sounds, just listening to you, it sounds like you're also a big believer in shine theory, right? The idea that if I shine, you shine. And 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 I have seen that relationship uh, in real time in your relationship with Victoria Edie Butler. Oh, yeah. And I'm wondering if you can just, I, I know you love talking about her, so I want to give you a chance to do that, okay. to tell a little bit of her story. And just, I, I mean, she is also uh, part of this historic journey uh th that also obviously ties to her family lineage but but she's making history in her own right in this moment absolutely I, I run the company but make no mistake about it she is the queen so consider me the prime minister <laughs> but victoria holds the crown 
And, and I make sure everybody knows that because Queen V, which is what we call her in our company, some call her Queen Victoria, uh, but we, we call her Queen V. And she is Nearest Green's great, great granddaughter. She is our master blender. She is, she's made history so many times, but one of the ways she made history was being named uh, master blender of the year back to back by Whiskey Magazine, our oldest magazine in the industry. And when she did it, it was the first time ever anyone had received that honor back to back. Not the first time a black person or a woman, first time anyone had ever received that back to back. She's now four time recipient of Master Blender of the Year. And it is it truly is whiskey is in her blood because I watched her do her first blend and she was only supposed to do the first blend of 1884. My idea on that was every one of Nearest's descendants would blend their own batch. So they'd be surrounded by our specialists and our company that have the best uh, taste buds, that have the best palates, and that they would essentially help Nearest's descendants to, to, to learn how to blend. But every single one was supposed to be a different one. I watched Victoria in that first one, and she began to take command halfway through. Like literally, she's surrounded by people who have been doing this a really long time. And she was like, that one's in, that one's out. That one's in, that one's out. And I don't want that one in my blend. Halfway through the first time. And, and it flew through the doors so fast and began winning gold medals so fast. I said, Victoria, we don't have time to, we had already lined up the second person in the family who was supposed to do the second batch. I said, we got to call Lisa and tell her she'll have to do the third batch. I need you to do a second bet. And I was so confident in her abilities. I didn't even show up at the second, at the second tasting. I hadn't tasted Victoria's second batch until it was in the market. Wow. And I mean, and it just began to fly. So now that 1884 small batch that Victoria hand selects everything, that began to you to come literally neck and neck with our original 1856. And I said, well, B, just take over the whole thing. Take over 1856, take over 18, take over single, take over everything. And from that point forward, she has overseen every drop of whiskey that goes into the market, every single one. And so every award that we have won, all hail the queen. Yeah, the queen's touch. I, that that's that's remarkable. I did not re realize. I mean, everything that that uh, e every drop of whiskey, she 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 has touched that. That's that's incredible. Uh, you talked about uh, all Americans, uh, you know, really having a chance to succeed. I want to come back to that idea because, I mean, you didn't start this this journey of, of Uncle Nearest. You said that the Uncle Nearest five years old. I mean, you were that that would have made you around forty, correct? When you, I was exactly forty when I when I began this. I'm now forty six, and yeah, I was exactly forty when I began this. Yeah, I, I just think that, that that is worth naming and mentioning too, because you didn't ask for permission. You weren't worried about what things have sort of looked like when you started oh. Uncle Nearest. I mean, what is, what do you say to Black women who who may not have it all figured out at that age, who may be wondering what to do next? Uh, I, I think that this is also just an incredibly inspiring story for folks who may be on their second, third, fourth, you know, act or beyond. Yeah, well, I mean, if you look at even Victoria, she's 61. Right. So by the time she had come into this, she I was able to bring her into the company because she had been with the DOJ for 31 years and was eligible for retirement. So, so you're talking about a person who oversaw pathology and, and criminology for the DOJ here in, in Tennessee for all those years, who then switched and said, I'm going to follow my heart on this. I'm going to. And so I think for, for women, this company was built on my gut, 100% on my gut. I didn't check numbers. I didn't check with, with what the big guys were doing. I didn't check with what had come before us. I literally built it on my gut and I surrounded myself with people who would trust my gut. That if it came down to stats versus my gut, we would go with my gut. And I'm going to tell you now, my gut hasn't been wrong. And so I think women, we have this intuition that if we are confident enough to tap into it, everything that we need is already in us. We just are constantly looking for a mentor. I didn't have no mentors. Let me just throw that out there. Not a single human being. I had books. I read books on America's Titans. 
I understood what were the mistakes they made, but I also understood what were the, the common denominators among Americans, America's Titans. Like dive in, you don't have to wait for permission or mentorship from anybody. Go with your gut. And if you're not sure how to execute what's in your gut, find the books. At this point, literally Google, God bless it. There is no reason that we cannot get access to every single thing we need access to at this point. Yeah, I, I, it's uh, it's interesting that you're, you're bringing up, uh, you did not have the benefit of, of mentors uh, as you embarked on this journey. Uh, and yet you are, you are very conscious about making space for others. Are, is being a mentor something that is important to you? Being the person that you wish you had had uh, in this industry in life, is that something that is important to you now? Is that something that you're doing, uh, as, particularly as a black woman? There, there's no one who I wish I had that at all. I, I think that the the strength that I have, the confidence that I have, is the fact that I didn't have anybody to to show me the way. I think that there's a there's a couple of different ways that people can go at, at it. If you have mentors that are around you, by all means, utilize them. I I did not have that, right? For people who have that, use it. But if you don't have it, do not let that be a hindrance. And so I am a mentor only because this industry scares a lot of women and people of color. Before we came into this, I this is not a hyperbole when I say this. The very first speaking engagement I did within our industry, I was speaking to a thousand white men. The only women in the entire room were two women that were coordinating it and two women that came with me. Everyone else in the room was a white man. I was told there were a couple of black men in there. I couldn't point, I couldn't tell you where they were. All a sea of white men, right? I just recently did another speaking engagement. The room is completely different now. When we came in, there was no women master blenders. There were no women master distillers. There were no women who were presidents of the spirit conglomerates. There's basically six major spirit conglomerates. Three of them are now women. This has all happened since Uncle Nearest came in. And so I think that for us, not I think, I know, is we became proof of concept. Right. People began trying to figure out, OK, how did they come into this industry? Nobody on the team had any de deep knowledge of the industry. They stepped in, did something that's never been done before. So then people began thinking it must be the fact that she's black. It must be the fact that she's a woman. And they began putting people in these positions to try to figure it out because they couldn't figure it out. And so I, I, I do I do feel honored that I was able to go first. But that's, again, I look at myself as four minute mile. I want to see this being broken immediately and over and over and over and over again. I want to be challenged to stay on top. Yeah. And, and your example and that representation uh, being even more powerful for people than, than because you can't mentor everybody, right? But you can no. example to anybody who is paying attention to anybody who could be thinking about, could, could encounter you, encounter your story and think, you know, maybe I could do that too, whether that's uh, the whiskey industry or, or whatever it is that they're, that they're wanting to do. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's all, it's all, it is all in our gut. I can't speak for men. I can only speak for women. It's all in our gut. We just tend to not have the confidence to trust it, but if we do trust it, sky's the limit. Yeah. And you are tapped in. Uh, that is that is definitely clear. <laughs> Just yeah. listening to you and seeing uh, the success that you have had. Uh, I, I want to also talk about um, some of some of the work, the opportunities that have been created, uh, what you've been able to do because of who you are and because uh, of the, the success of Uncle Nears in terms of that legacy building that you mentioned yeah. earlier. Uh, I, I, I guess I, I'm thinking about the incubator uh, fund that, that you have started or even the HBCU challenge that you yeah. have going right now, going uh, for the next couple of months. Can you talk about what you're working on now that you want people to know about, that you want yeah. them to be able to support uh, if, if they know about it? Uh, yeah. What are some of these things? How are you thinking about those priorities in terms of legacy? There's so there's so many things, and it's it's interesting because when I look at it, it's never about how can people help us with this. Really, isn't it's about how can we take what we're already doing, help other people. So the HBCU challenge that you're referencing, 
our most popular cocktail around the world, but especially here in the United States is the old fashioned. We sell a lot of old fashions. And so I said, you know, let's put that old fashioned to work. When Deion Sanders left uh, Jackson State and decided to go to Colorado, people thought that was a massive blow to the HBCUs. But it, it wasn't really the fact that Dion was leaving that was the huge blow. And people didn't, I don't think, really know how to address this. It's the fact that Dion was keeping a spotlight on the HBCUs. Like everywhere he go, he went, he brought cameras with him. It's the same thing that MLK did. When he showed up, he always showed up with cameras. That's why people would say, "Here, the circus is in town. Because he didn't just come with just him and, and some brothers. Right. He came with cameras. And, and so I have so many eyeballs on me because of what we've been able to do in an industry in which a woman, a person of color has never been able to do it, that it became a real clear, natural thing for me to say, let's shift these cameras that are on us Let's shift it to the HBCUs. And because so many leaders in other industries and even in our industry are looking at us and looking at what are they, what are they really uh, giving toward? What, what are they pushing toward? When it comes to people that are not Black, uh, they're generally, even though they want their heart to be there, they don't have the same kind of connection. So if you can't make it a capital improvement for them, which is what their bonuses are tied to. If you can't make it a, a capital improvement, it's very difficult to get their hearts behind it. I, 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 there's no other way I can say it. And so when we're doing things to, uh, toward the Black community or toward women, it has to be something that they can replicate and make good money from it. But for HBCUs, you're talking about millions of alumni around this country. So the thought process was we're we're still small compared to the big guys, but if we step in and say, okay, we're going to give a million dollars to the HBCUs for every every old fashioned sold, Uncle Nearest old fashioned sold, we're donating a dollar to HB to the top 58 HBCUs to use however they want. And the the number one is Spelman. And because that's an all woman's college is the reason why not only are we doing it here during Black History Month, but also extending it into Women's History Month is to really shine a light on, on Spelman. But overall, now you've got corporations that are going, wait, 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 they're doing, they're doing what? They're, you know, the number of old fashions now being purchased by HBCU alum and those who are going to HBCUs and teaching at HBCUs just went through the roof, right? And so now other companies can go, okay, well, what else do we have that that these HBCU alums would be interested in that we could then give back to their institutions that they care so much about? So this goes back to that four, four minute mile, right? We do it first. Hopefully, whoever comes comes after us will do it even bigger. And the incubation program that you were talking about, there's there's a few of them. We could be here all day because we have so many give back things. But we two different ones, the Black Business Booster Program, we if there is a, a black owned spirit brand in the market doing well, we either help them or are currently helping them. Every single one. This is not, again, hyperbole. This is literally fact. If you go in and you see a black owned spirit brand on a shelf, rest assured that they've been on the phone with me our chief business officer, our head of marketing, and we have freely given of our time and connections and capital and things of that nature. So that's the Black Business Booster Program. I didn't want anyone coming in this industry to feel alone. I'm comfortable feeling alone, but I recognize that that's not most people. So giving most people what it is that they need uh, was important and giving it to them how they needed it. So that's the Black Business Booster Program. We started the uh, leadership apprentice program, which is the incubation of, of people of color being raised up in our industry so we can further diversify and put people of color in top positions. So we did that alongside Jack Daniels. So it's the nearest and Jack advancement initiative, that same allyship that's being brought together. And, and then through that same uh, NJAI, we also have the business incubation program. And that is we literally come around a particular brand, a distillery, and we give them all of our resources. There are trademark attorneys, our marketing people, our PR people, our whatever it is that they need to succeed. 
we surround them. Uh, Denord, who was our very first one in the business incubation program, they got an order from, from Delta for 50 ml so where they'd be able to go on the planes. Well, they didn't have an ability to bottle 50 ml. So Jack Daniel said, we'll do that for you. That kind of stuff, right? And, and so we have that going on. We've always paid for all of Neris's descendants to go to college, and no matter where they want to go in the country. And they only have one requirement, truly, and that is to maintain a 3.0. That because if, if I'm going to pay for you to go to school, you're, you're going to do the work, right? I'm doing things with excellence. I'm going to need you to do things with excellence. But also it separates the shaft from the wheat because those are the same people that my hope is will all work for Uncle Nearest one day. And they'll get their degrees and their master's degrees and their JDs and all the rest of that. They will find their place in the world, get the experience under their belt. And then I'm able to go and bring them back in to this company so that you literally can't walk around this company without bumping into a green. That's that's the hope. Now, right now you can't go nowhere without bumping into Victoria. So it's all good. <laughs> uh, but, the, but the hope is, is that, that Victoria's cousins and siblings and nieces and nephews that in the, in the years ahead, in the next 25 years that I hope to continue le to lead this company, that it will be really, really difficult for you to find a leadership position in which a green is not in. That's incredible. Well, I know, um, geez, just even thinking uh, a generation into the future is is incredible to imagine. Uh, but I wonder, just even in these first five years that that you have been in existence, what would you say the greatest lesson that this journey has taught you so far is? The greatest lesson? Be yourself be authentic. It's not going to work for everybody, but your purpose isn't meant to be understood by everyone. You, you have this, this idea that if you are a, a leader, you should go around uh, gathering consensus, right? That, that you should have a consensus. And, and that, that's, that's not true. Your job is to mold consistency, right? It is to create that, that, that consensus where the, this is the purpose. Everyone has to be aligned to the purpose. And if they're not aligned, they're not supposed to be there. And, and, and so we have to get really comfortable as leaders of saying, this is my purpose. I'm going to double down in my purpose. And everybody who's supposed to be with me on this journey to fulfill this purpose, that's who will be with me. And I'm going to lose people along the way. I'm going to offend some people along the way because I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to wrap it in a bow because I don't have that kind of time. If I have 25 years left to lead this company, what I'm not going to do is spend that time trying to figure out how to sugarcoat things for other people. Just not going to happen. I'm going to do it with kindness. I'm going to do it with grace. But you better believe I'm going to do it with grit. Absolutely. Yeah, no, you don't have... Uh that kind of time, other people's comfort cannot be the priority when you, when you're operating in purpose. I mean, I, I, I have learned so much, uh, being in conversation with you here, Fawn, never thought that I could be using my old fashioned habit for good, but I <laughs> over the next couple of months, uh, but thank you so much for making time to celebrate with us today for your insights, for your leadership, uh, for your vision and for the legacy that you are building. Thank you. I appreciate you having me truly.